How are you? Hey guys, how are you? Great to we see you. We are great, Dave. Dave. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Hey, Please Dave, call I me Snake. To... Please call okay, me Snake. Whenever call anybody snake. calls Yeah, whenever anybody calls me Dave, I feel like I'm in trouble. Okay. <laughs> okay, Snake. So, Snake, the last time that I saw you was in summer of 2019 in Huntington, Long Island at the Ace Fraley show, and you got up on stage and played Snowblind. What an absolute uh, joy and privilege it was. As everybody, I've made it very clear throughout my re like 35 years of being in a band that Ace is one of my hugest influences and Kiss is one of the biggest influences on Skid Row. And so to get that opportunity to get up there and play one of my favorite Ace Freely songs was just uh, extremely humbling. And if you remember, I was bowing to him through for like five minutes before we could even play the song <laughs> because yeah. it's just, that was great. He, he's the guy that I would sit in front of a mirror and pretend to be when I was 16 years old. Uh, and he was played such a huge part in my upbringing as a guitar player. And then consistently throughout that, uh, when we formed Skid Row and, and we're writing for Skid Row, his influences are all over all of our records, as is, you know, uh, the rest of Kiss. Uh, but I love the guy. He's been nothing but just the kindest person to me. And so I'm excited about his studio. I had heard about it. And uh, I guess you guys are going to be doing it in Jersey. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to. Are you in Jersey still or are you, have you moved down to Nashville? No, I'm in Long Island. I can't leave the East oh. Coast. Good. Well, I'm glad you're still here. So you can, you can come. It's not going to be that far. No, I'll definitely go. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm in. Okay. Nice. Nice. So, so, Dave, we originally booked the interview for you to come on and talk about something really, really cool. Uh, one of my first guitars as a kid was a Kramer Pacer. And I'm so excited that you are working with gibson now that who owns kramer to bring right. back this great brand that just meant so much to me and my rock and roll upbringing and you and tracy guns have introduced signature models and i am just so excited to because i knew gibson bought the rights i guess or the the brand Gip, uh, kramer a while ago but they hadn't really done anything with it and now you guys right. are working with them and let's just talk about Let's go right into the the guitar itself. It's Snake Sabo Beretta. I love it. I love it. Tell us about the guitar and how this came about. Well, well this came about, this whole thing started in 1985. Um, I was working at a music store in Toms River, New Jersey, which is where uh, I met Rachel. And that was the basically the beginning of the band. Uh, but in 85... Uh, I had an idea for a guitar, like a crazy ass paint job on it. And I wanted to make it really simple. Uh, I wanted a thin neck, thin frets, uh, reverse headstock, uh, very simple body design. And I wanted to have a Floyd Rose on it. And so when I had the idea for the, for the artwork on it, uh, there was a gentleman I worked with who was the manager of the music store, a guy by the name of Paul Unkert, who used to also build guitars there. And so we decided that we were going to build this guitar here. Now, at the same time, Kramer's only right down the road in Neptune, New Jersey. Uh, and the Bon Jovi guys had been working with them. And so uh, I was very familiar with their, they were like in our backyard. So I was very familiar with, with their different products and, um, then I found out through Paul Unker and through Rachel's brother about an airbrush artist in uh, down in that area who did like vans and hot rods and stuff like that. And so I presented the idea, like just my idea up here. I'm not an artist uh, by any stretch. So he uh, came up with this design and I'm like, there's no way that is just too killer. You know, for like for a 20 year old kid, that's like amazing. And then he put it on the guitar body. And I was like, this is out of control. So we put the guitar together at the music store. 
and it was good. It was uh, it was cool and it worked and and uh, I guess we did as good a job as we could at that point. And then we got introduced to the Kramer folks through the Bon Jovi guys and became very close with them. And they were just amazing. They welcomed the, welcomed us into their family as if they had known us forever. And they took really great pride that we were a Jersey band. And they were, you know, we rehearsed in a garage. We played all the local dives uh, just because of our friendships with the Bon Jovi guys and other people in the area. We weren't given anything. You know, we had to work for everything. And so they saw the band and and they were like, well, let's, you know, or they heard some of the demos, if I'm not mistaken. And they were like, let's see if we can work together. And we were like, oh, my gosh, that would be amazing. So they started hooking us up with some guitars. And I said, well, I have this snake guitar. And they're like, let's take a look at it. And they totally kind of revamped it with the exception of the Beretta body. Um it was a warmth body, but it, it specked up to the to the Beretta. Um, but we kept the warmth body, and then everything else on it became Kramer, and they set it up, and it just played and sounded amazing, and that played a huge part in our first two records and our first, you know, uh, two world tours or more than two world tours, I should say. And then as as time got on. We uh, Kramer started kind of going downhill a little bit and they weren't as prominent as they were. And so they started cutting back a little bit and uh, we all remained friends, but we it was unanimously decided that we would, you know, go down and see what else is out there that maybe might fit our needs uh, at this particular point. And so through many years of going through different guitar companies and loving all of them and having great experiences with everybody. Uh, it turns out about three years ago, well, actually even longer than that. When I was in LA living in LA, uh, managing bands out of, uh, McGee entertainment in Los Angeles, there was a kid that came in to intern for me. And I just, I destroyed this guy, verbally abused him and just in a good way as, <laughs> as, as Jersey sarcasm goes. And uh, he, he took it all. This guy by the name of Todd Harapiak, he took it all like crazy. And he, we got along fantastic. And so he said, what's it going to take to get that snake guitar? He like wanted me to give it to him. I'm like, <laughs> things packed away man that's like that's my baby that's packed away that's not going anywhere cut to and that was probably 2007 cut to about two and a half years ago i'm reading online about uh dave rude from tesla about his white ex- epiphone explorer and in it he thanks todd harapiak and I'm like, that can't be the same dude. So I reach out to him. I go, you know, his ass face, is this really you? And he's like, gets back to me, he goes, absolutely. He goes, when are we going to do a signature model on that snake guitar? Like the first thing he said to me. Wow. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, and I'm thinking he's just, you know, BSing me. And then I... He goes, you know, Kramer uh, is owned by Gibson now. And I said, I had no idea because I didn't. I I wasn't up to up to date on it. I was really excited about that because I had heard about all the changes that were going on with Gibson. It was really inspiring. So we happened to be down in Nashville at the time. And I uh, I said, well, I'll consider it if you get me one of these. And I sent them a picture of an Explorer. And sure enough, three days later, I had an Explorer at the house. And I'm like, wow, Wow. he's for real. So we started talking, and he introduced me, and I brought Scotty with me to to Cesar, who's like the CMO of the company, and Al John Go. Um, And we started – just having a, a light conversation and it felt like we all knew each other for a really, really long time. 
they were well versed on our history. I mean, Al John's from uh, Argentina, and he saw us play down there in 1992. And the fact that he wanted to do something with me in in you know 2000, you know 2020, 2021 was just it was so humbling to me. And he was like, "This will be a passion project for me, man." And so Todd, I really owe all the credit in the world for this for to Todd to begin with because he never let up on the idea, and he actually pushed it through. And to see Gibson, the resurgence that they've had and the way they've really turned everything around and went back to being who they are, which is a guitar company. You know, they're not an electronics company. They're not a specialist company. They're a guitar company, man. And they're such a huge part of the history of rock and roll that that was getting lost. Like when we heard that they might be filing Chapter 11 like three, four years ago, um, we were brokenhearted. We are like, how can the world live without Gibson? It just doesn't right. make any sense. Right. Right. And so That's it was point. it was amazing to see the the turnaround and we toured the factory and you could you could sense this energy this great energy and positivity uh and everyone was so kind and respectful uh and then uh I spoke further with Cesar and it was like we're going to do this and they tracked down Dennis Klein who was the original artist and nice. got the artwork uh, and said, we're going to do a limited run. And I'm like, I never had a signature edition before. I don't know what this, you know, is like. And they were like 35 years and you haven't had one. I'm like, no, I never sought one out. I, <laughs> maybe it's my, you know, uh, uneasiness with, with that portion of my ego. I don't know. Um, wow. but I, I can't tell how you how that all worked. How, how that all worked. With it really was. It, it happened so fast. Uh, uh, Jim DeCola is the uh, guy who who the made pick the pickups guys. for yeah. me. Oh, and I didn't even know it, but I worked with him at PV when I was with PV years ago. Uh, when we when I endorsed uh, the fifty one fifties and the Wolfgangs uh, when Edward was still there. So he did Edward's pickups, and you know, at one point did mine as well. So it was great to have him back in the fold. Wow. So, that's, that's Dave, great. I yeah. am like the the tech uh, nut, but especially when it comes to guitars. So, I just had a couple of quick things that I wanted to ask you about some of the tech specs. Now, one of the things that I hadn't even thought of before, which is a, a basic thing, is that I know that you've said that having a reverse headstock, which I just think looks super cool, actually helps the guitars balance a little bit better, right? Absolutely. For me, it does. Absolutely. It does. It looks great. But yeah, as far as the balance goes, it sits perfectly on me. Yeah, it doesn't like you can like put your hands off of it. And it doesn't like fall way down one way or the other. So that's great. Now, I love the fact that you got the D-Tuna on there. And then I wanted to ask you uh, and, and for fans for what that if you uh, listeners, what that is, is you can tune down to a drop detuning quickly by just flipping a switch. And uh, that's on the Floyd Rose. And is, is that an Eddie Van Halen? thing yes right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, adam reaver and uh right. and eddie came up with it for fu tone and nice. adam's an old dear friend his his products are amazing i use them on all my guitars uh and you know what we usually like a lot of times we usually open up with slave to the grind so for and which is drop d and we have a couple other things that are drop d too so for me it's really easy it's just like a flick of a switch and i'm there that's awesome and mark and i both know adam as well and then mark i'll let you jump back in but i just want to ask one more question um the fingerboard your your old guitar probably had a rosewood fingerboard i would say and and now this new one has indian laurel and you said that's almost like an ebony even it is. It feels smooth and slick like that. It doesn't look like an ebony fretboard per se, but it feels like one to me. And I nice. think that the frets are the frets are a little bit bigger on on a little bit wider on this one than they were than they are on the original. But I had no problem with that. It felt great. Like nice. I'm playing the, back the prototype. I'm playing the prototype live. Like <laughs> like awesome. I just made some quick quick adjustments, and I it's not like I. I, I'm like I'm keeping this and I'm I'm playing it live. You guys just got to go by memory on the you know I'm on a distribution awesome. of this. <laughs> <laughs> very very cool. 
Right on. And and Snake, uh, again, we will direct people to the website where they can check out the guitar. It is Snake Sabo Beretta by Kramer. And let's talk about Skid Row. Um, you guys have a singer, ZP. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with him, where he came from, how long he's been in the band? ZP's been in a band between four and five years. He originally sang for a band called Dragon Force. Um, we had become friends with him when he had his, like, his own band in the UK called IMI. They opened up a bunch of shows for us, and we hit it off really well, especially Rachel and him. And so <clears throat> when we started looking for uh, a singer, he was kind of the first person that we reached out to. And he lives in the UK, so it doesn't make things easy. But we flew him over to Nashville, jammed with him for a little while. And the great thing about him is that he came in and he knew way more songs than we did. Like he knew 18, wow. 19 songs. And we were prepared to play, th you know, three or four. <laughs> and so he <laughs> Skid Row like, songs. He knew more Skid yeah. Row songs than Skid Row. He did. <laughs> he absolutely did. And so we jammed on a bunch of stuff and he just was kind hearted and you could tell he was a team player. It wasn't a front. Uh, and so we said, okay, let's do this on kind of a trial basis. Cause we've had some bad experiences uh, lately. So, <laughs> so sorry decided, for laughing. <laughs> yeah, we decided, we decided to do some, uh, a bunch of shows with him and, kind of not officially in the band, but the more we played with them and the more comfortable we felt, uh, it was inevitable. We, we all knew that, that he should be in the band. So what, it didn't take very long, uh, before to make it sort of official, but it was, you could tell right off the bat that this was going to work. And one of the great things about him is that he's, he respects the legacy of the songs and the history of the band. Uh, so he wants to do them justice. Uh, and of course, he's his own singer, but he wants to stay as true to the original as possible. And I really respect that uh, because one of the things that's interesting is that he grew up on us. So he's got uh, he knows our complete history, which is why he knew all those songs, uh, because he used to, he would practice them all the time and he would warm up with them when he was in Dragon Force. So uh it was it was definitely serendipitous that it would happen and and he's brought so much positivity to the band that you know it's funny awesome. we all actually get along really well and we all really like each other and you know on days off we hang out with each other and uh you know we're always in constant contact with one another especially through this pandemic um which has made it very difficult to sort of communicate but thank god for zoom you know and yeah Right. And we've done a bunch of uh we've written a bunch of stuff via Zoom. Uh so it's not the the ideal way of doing things for us, but uh it's it's what you have to do at this particular point. Right on. Right, right. on. And now, uh, he's been with you for how many years now? Between four and five. Right. And it I saw him with you guys. I'm, I think it was M three. Was it two thousand nineteen? I'm thinking that was a great show, really. M3 is yeah. such a great festival. You guys oh, are great. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. I love playing there. And, you know, it's uh, it's on the East Coast, on the Eastern Seaboard. Kix is always there, which is always a bonus. Right. Uh, you know, we've known those guys since the very beginning of Skid Row. So it's great to see them. They're such a great band. Uh, and they always put together a really good bill. Yeah. So no doubt you know, about it. Yeah, M three is always always great. Um, Snake, I I wanted to just touch way back to something early early when you started playing guitar that I just thought was a cool thing, and I know this, but maybe some of our listeners and we've got some new listeners to the show, so uh, they they might not know this. When when you started playing guitar way back in like 1978 1979, your friend. Was was somebody who everybody is a household name, and uh, and he was initially showing you stuff, and then he turned you on to his guitar teacher. Why don't you tell us about that? And I know you That's know what I'm exactly, talking about. Exactly, exactly true. Uh, I grew up with John Bon Jovi, and we're still the best of friends. Matter of fact, we texted each other today, and 
uh, just break each other's balls. That's all our texts consist of. It's never, <laughs> hey, how you doing? It's never, ever anything like that. <laughs> it's like time to get verbally beat up, you know. So, <laughs> but when he he lived three blocks away from me up the street in uh, in Sarahville, New Jersey, and so I think I had met him when I was around ten or eleven, uh, walking up the street to a friend's house who lived across the street from him. Saw him outside playing basketball and, and challenged him to a one on one game, and we became friends from there. Uh, shortly thereafter, he started playing guitar. And I was fascinated by it. Uh, roughly around the same time, I was about 14 and a half. Uh, my brother bought a terrible acoustic guitar, like from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, <laughs> played it for about three weeks and gave up on it. Now, this was a uh, opportunity for me to one up my brother. So I started I started teaching myself utilizing the Roy Clark quick pick and fun strum and home guitar course. Uh, which I love you, bought that. Off the you bought it off in the television. It was four albums and a bunch of, uh, you know, books, instructional books. And then I was getting frustrated with that. It was boring, whatever. So John offered to teach me a bunch of chords and stuff like that and some scales. And uh, luckily I learned them real quick. And then he suggested you because you know what? Why don't you just go to the guy that teaches me? He lives right across the street. And his name was Al Paranello, and he became a mentor to both of us. And what an amazing human being. I mean, he was a great teacher uh, of not only the guitar, but of the passion that should go into playing it and taught us both a, a lot about life um, and how music plays. <coughs> Excuse me such an important role in life and it's stuck with us ever since and again he was he was our probably my as far as mentor goes in my early years he was the uh, the most prevalent and the most powerful what, what an amazing teacher and and what like how cool is he and how great is he as an influence that Two of his students have went on to do such great things in the music industry. I think that's really a great story. Well, it's pretty amazing to think that we live in a in a three block radius. Like it's it's wow. a it's a it's a one minute walk from John's old house to Al's old house, and it was a five minute walk from my house to both of theirs. So, wow, uh, it's just yeah, it's just incredible. I look back on that, and you know we were unbelievably close with Al until he passed away and and John and I are still unbelievably close so it's there's something really to be said about that Jersey Brotherhood thing absolutely right on. Now, now snake you Mark and I are in Jersey as well so we're, we're hoping to carry that on in the future I know you are I know you guys are in Jersey I love that yeah when, when you come when you know when the pandemic or whenever you feel like it come down hang with us in Jersey Man, I'll tell you what, you won't get me out of there. I'm I'm addicted. I've been I'm a Jersey boy through and through and I'll tell you what. I lived in California for 11 years and that was 14 years too long and I missed <laughs> I missed Jersey every step of the way. And the funny thing is is that the majority I had a small group of friends out there and most of them were from Jersey or 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 somewhere on the East Coast. It was just that's just the way it is, you know. <laughs> And so when I got back to the East Coast, when I got back to the East Coast, even though I'm out on Long Island, I'm still I'm on the East Coast again. You know, I'm right. Right. On. Long, I, I consider Long Island, Manhattan, and Jersey all one thing, pretty much. Like, without a doubt. I mean, you know what? Twisted Sister, being from Long Island, they had such a huge influence on us in the early days. You know, mm -hmm. just the fact that they worked so hard. And they were able to make it the way, you know, to the heights that they did. And you could see them five nights a week grinding it out. And when they when they finally made it, I mean, I couldn't believe I was going to see them. 2,000, 3,000 people were, were showing up and they didn't have a record deal. I was like, this is insanity. Yeah. And then and then they got signed and it was like and you saw them all over MTV and touring everywhere. And you're like. For a kid from, you know, from Sayreville, it was like, okay, Twisted Sisters done it. John Bon Jovi's doing it. It's very possible. 
and uh, it was a it was a huge influence. No so, doubt about so it. So you you mentioned earlier that you work for McGee McGee Entertainment, I guess it is, and yes. I wanted to ask you about that because I mean that's a enormous name. Doc just uh, booked us a Paul Stanley interview recently, which was absolutely incredible to be able to speak to my idol. But uh, what do you do with Doc and and what's your role in McGee? Well, I'm sort of like an independent contractor. I'm, I'm a, I do management. And when I moved out to LA, uh, I moved out to LA in about 2001, uh, sort of trying to find my way out there and then realized that I've, I've always had an interest in the business of music and was able to educate myself pretty well. And I had great teachers in Doc McGee and Scott McGee, amazing teachers and, and, and the Bon Jovi guys. Uh, and a, a group of, you know, all the agents that we ever worked with around the world and the different labels that we worked with. It was all extremely educational. Um, I always wanted to be the guy that that could come into, you know, the president of a record label's office and not be dumbfounded in the corner because I didn't understand the terminology and what it meant of what they were speaking of when it came to con contracts and terminology. Um so I educated myself, and as I got older, I took a, more of an interest in wanting initially to to you know work with friends if that was possible. Um, and so I, you know, I'm like Doc, just let me you know let me work out of the office here. No, 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 no. You're a pain in the ass. Blah blah blah. Stick to <laughs> writing music and stuff like that. And yeah, I get that. But we were in a uh, we had some downtime, and so I just kept hanging out at the office in L.A. I came in every day, and sat at a desk, and just went around the office because there was a uh, probably 12, 13 people working there. I'm like, can I help out with anything? Can I, you know, very humble, uh, not using my success with Skid Row to any of my advantage at all. Just being like, you know what? How can I help? And that led into me becoming a part of this show that we put on for the troops at Camp Pendleton, uh, which was like 60,000 people. And, uh, you know, Godsmack was there and, and uh, Destiny's Child, uh, Richie Sambora, uh, you know, Kiss. It was just... It was a mind-boggling event, and that was kind of okay. Here you go; you're thrown into the to the quicksand. See if you can survive. And over the course of you know 48 straight hours of being awake and running around like a crazy person, and basically being the liaison between all the acts that were on the bill and our uh, executives, that's how I uh, was utilized, and it went over amazingly. And so. I was like, I like doing this. I like talking to the different artists. I knew a lot of them. Uh, they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm in management. They're like, no way. And so right. <laughs> uh, shortly after that, I started working with a singer-songwriter in California by the name of Randy uh, Coleman, whom was amazing. Um, and it was a different thing for me. Uh, but we were able to get him some good publishing deals and things of that nature. And then shortly thereafter... Um uh, Rex Brown came into the office and said that well Philip and him and, and Pepper are putting down back together. And we want you, you know, we want to know if you're interested in managing it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I go, you guys are my friends and really good friends. And I go, the only way that I would do it is if that we ever saw a time where our friendship was being destroyed we'd have to walk away from each other to somehow preserve that friendship. Uh, and so we started working together and we still do. <laughs> Rex is wow. no longer with the band. He's gone on to do his own stuff, but right. we still work together. And it's really been such a great life experience to work with, you know, with friends. Philip has been my buddy since they toured with us in 1992 and we've always maintained a really close relationship. We're like, you know, the least likely of people to be like really good friends. Uh, but yet we are. And, um, 
you know, it's funny. He's so not a difficult person to work with or manage. Uh, very, very smart. Cool. Uh, very, very open to listening to alternative ideas and uh, not completely set in his ways like a lot of artists who have, who have, you know, stamped their name on the music industry are. Um, and he's, uh, he's been a, a pleasure. And same thing with Pepper Keenan and Kirk Winstein and Jimmy Bauer. They've been amazing. Uh, they've, we've had so many great moments together and hopefully they'll start working again soon. They've taken like a three year hiatus and, you know, Philip's been doing, uh, the Philip H and some on the illegals and did arson anthem for a little while and then super joint for a little while. So, scour he's doing so he's got a lot of stuff on his plate and kirk's got crowbar and pepper's got coc and jimmy's got i hate god and and super joint as well so they've always had a lot of stuff going on and down has always been a band that would put out stuff and then you know walk away for a little while and we always knew that and that's just the way it's been so but i think that uh within the next year uh they're going to have some wow. some stuff coming out we would love some more down music. Cool. That would be incredible. Um, Snake, we do have another guest coming on, so we do have to kind of wind things down. I did sure. mention to the listeners that we were going to be talking with you, and I always like to try to include a, a question from the listeners. So here's one yes. for you. Uh, would you mind asking Snake about the possibility of subhuman ra race being released on vinyl? I know it's not the favorite of the bands, but I love it so much. It was my first Skid Row record. Uh, any, do you uh, have control over that? Any thoughts on releasing that on vinyl? There is the strong possibility that everything that we've done with Atlantic Records is going to come out in a box set. Uh, we're working on all of that now, believe it or not. Nice. Wow. So yes, there's yeah. a very good there's a very good possibility. You know, Rhino handles all of that stuff, uh, and so from what I'm told by them, that they are working on doing uh, all of the records that we did with Atlantic. Right on. So, cool. and Snake. I also wanted before we let you go to give a big shout out. You mentioned him earlier, Todd. What was his last name again? Todd. Uh... Todd Harapiak. Yeah, big thanks to Todd because he actually hooked up this interview for us. So I appreciate nice. yes, that. Yes, he did. He did. Yes. And he's just he's great, man. I mean, there's he's got so much passion and and he's got a wealth of knowledge and he just loves what he does. And you know, I'm really, really uh, uh grateful that that he's a friend and and uh that he's done so much for for Scotty and myself. Right on, right on. Well, Excellent. Snake, we wish you all the best. We cannot wait for Skid Row to get back out there and playing shows we're ready uh so hopefully uh we get this coronavirus thing in the back re rear view mirror very soon and we can get our live well we're supposed to, we're supposed to start in july so let's hope you know and yeah uh go, yeah. going out on the road in july but uh thank you guys so much for your time i love talking thank to you. fellow jersey boys absolutely oh, yeah. snake we will see you on the road i'll be there no matter what <laughs> Excellent. Give uh give Michael my best. I love Michael. Michael Sweet. Absolutely. Yeah, you Absolutely. might actually be able to say hi to him if you hang on. You can go into the backstage room here and and uh, he'll probably be there wait, waiting yeah. to uh, come on. So <laughs> okay. Thanks, Nick. That'd be awesome. I'd love to see it. Okay. I'd love to see him. Take care, Snake. Thanks. Thank All you right. again. Take care. Ladies and yeah, gentlemen, Snake from Skid Row. And yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. Um, I gotta crack a beer real quick here. First drink. Yeah, I'm gonna. Beer. I'll have a. You know, what I'm gonna have. Check this out. This is a uh, springtime margarita. It's one of the drinks on my menu. I still love Dash Vodka the best, but this is uh, just uh, something else. Oh, double. This is a. I get mixed up because it's backwards. Oh, there we go.